Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to the NUS Baba House. Uh, I'm Danielle, Assistant Manager from the Outreach and Education team here, and we're happy that you're able to join us today. So the talk that you have signed up to attend this afternoon is part of the Present Past Heritage Conservation Speaker Series. The series was devised to investigate the many ways in which the past and present form a dialectical relationship, creating new significances within public and personal memory. So there's policy, participation, documentation, and art uh, as how lenses which unveil the economies of heritage conservation and management and their impacts on the individual and the communities. So we'll have um, observations, case studies, and cross-references of heritage in Singapore and Southeast Asia within this series. And uh, this eventually leads us to wonder what heritage is and what it could become. The four talks in this series that are happening every other week over four weeks uh, also lead up to the APRU University Museums Research Symposium later at the end of this year that is on architectural heritage, which Baba House is also hosting. So for this first talk, we're very honored to have with us Dr. Jack Zentali, who will open the series with an exploration into how built heritage can be secured and enriched by giving greater recognition and protection in international and domestic law to the, ten to the intangible cultural aso heritage associated with it. He also discusses the scope for built heritage to be used as the means of protecting intangible cultural heritage. Dr. Jack Zentali is an expert member of the International Scientific Committee for Legal, Administrative and Financial Issues of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, a member of ICOMO Singapore and president of the Singapore Heritage Society since 2017. Previously a legal academic between 2008 and 2017, he maintains research interests in constitutional and administrative law, media law and heritage law. Jack is also a member of the National Collection Advisory Panel since 2013 and Archaeology uh, Advisory Panel since 2019 of the National Heritage Board and the Heritage and Identity Partnership of the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore since 2018. I'll quickly now pass the time over to Dr. Jack Lee now, who will begin his sharing. Dr. Jack Lee, please. Hi everyone. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, I hope you can see it. Hmm, I can't see you guys. Let me see. Okay. Uh, is it okay? Okay, I'm going to assume it's all right because uh, I can't see anyone else. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, sense of place, the intersection between built heritage and intangible cultural heritage in Singapore. Sorry. So um, the things I'm going to talk about today are how intangible cultural heritage can help to preserve uh, built heritage, both in international law as well as in domestic or Singapore law, and conversely, how built heritage can help to safeguard intangible cultural heritage as well. Um, I will say a little bit about how the Singapore Heritage Society is involved in this, and then look at some potential challenges. So let's look a little bit at the international law position. Uh, Singapore was a UNESCO member from 1965 to 1985, and then it left. Uh, the reasons why it left officially were that um, it was uh, not getting a lot of benefit out of UNESCO, and uh, they had to pay fees to UNESCO, so that was thought to be um, a bit much for the country to uh, bear. Um, unofficially, it seems that uh, some other large countries like the US and the UK had uh, left UNESCO because of unhappiness about how UNESCO was managing itself. Uh, but uh, um, we don't really know. This is what's speculated by, by some people. 
Um, in any case, uh, both the US and the UK rejoined, and then Singapore also decided to rejoin UNESCO in 2007. And quite uh, quickly after that, uh, it then became a member of the World Heritage Convention, and we got our first World Heritage Site on the World Heritage List, which is, of course, the Singapore Botanic Gardens in 2015. So in 2018, Singapore also joined another major UNESCO treaty, and this is the Convention for the Safeguarding of the Intangible Cultural Heritage. This is quite um, a widely accepted uh, convention. Uh, as of 2020, there are 180 countries that are already signatories to it. And um, the definition that is used in this convention of intangible cultural heritage is quite influential. So what is this idea of intangible cultural heritage? Well, according to the convention, it says that practices, representations, expressions, knowledge, skills, as well as instruments, objects, artifacts, and cultural spaces associated therewith that communities, groups, and in some cases, individuals recognize as part of their cultural heritage are intangible cultural heritage. And this cultural heritage is transmitted from generation to generation, is constantly recreated by communities and groups in response to their environment, their interaction with nature and their history, and provides them with a sense of identity and continuity, thus promoting respect for cultural diversity and human creativity. So you can see that ICH is a response to the environment and embraces cultural spaces, which are associated with practices, expressions, and so on. And state parties are obliged to take necessary measures to ensure the safeguarding of such cultural spaces. There's also another scheme um, called the UNESCO's Masterpieces of Oral and Intangible Heritage of Humanity program. And this, I think, actually predated the uh, Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. And it defined a cultural space as a place in which popular and traditional cultural activities are concentrated. But it could also be a time uh, generally characterized by a certain periodicity, sort of a, a season in the year that could even be a cultural space or by an event that happens regularly. So um, it is the point is made by some authors that um, ICH includes social and spiritual associations, symbolic meanings and memories associated with objects and places. And the important point is that tangible heritage, heritage that we can touch and feel and see, forms, uh, forms of such tangible heritage all gain meaning through intangible practice, use and interpretation. The tangible can only be interpreted through the intangible. So intangible types of heritage only make sense if you also consider it together with the intangible cultural heritage that's associated with it. So therefore, there's some interconnectedness between uh, intangible cultural heritage and tangible forms of cultural heritage. And I think this is also emphasized by um, other UNESCO documents. For example, the interconnectedness between ICH and built heritage buildings and so on is emphasized by the UNESCO recommendation on the historic urban landscape. What is an historic urban landscape? This is defined as including social and cultural practices and values, economic processes, and the intangible dimensions of heritage as are related to diversity and identity. So the example that I'm going to give is of Bukit Brown Cemetery. I think it's quite well known by now that Bukit Brown Cemetery and, and the adjoining cemetery called Seong Cemetery are collectively considered to be the largest Chinese cemetery outside China. Um, it was in use between sometime in the 19th century and 1973 when it was closed, and it contains some 100,000 graves. And many well-known members of the Chinese community are buried there. Um, it was a battle zone during World War II and therefore also contains unmarked war graves. And what sorts of intangible cultural heritage, for example, could be associated with the cemetery? Well, you can think about things like the design, ornamentation, and orientation of the tombs according to feng shui principles. You can also think about yearly rituals that are conducted at the cemetery to honor the dead, for example, tomb sweeping during the Qingming festival. And the tomb inscriptions themselves are a source of genealogical and historical information about prominent pioneers and ordinary people who are buried in the cemetery. Some pictures now. 
So I guess this is one of the, the tombs that you might find there. This is probably from a family that's fairly wealthy. You can see uh, quite detailed ornamentation uh, as well as uh, um, carvings and uh, inscriptions. And you can see that uh, the tomb is regularly visited. There's a joystick holder, and obviously someone has has been there recently to uh, put joysticks in the in the um, in the holder and, and offer make offerings as well. Uh, you can see features of the tombs. For example, the interesting tiles. Many of them uh, inter uh, imported from Europe. Uh, you can see the guardian lions. You can see a lotus figure. And you can also see at the, at the sides of the pillars, there are some uh, carvings with Chinese sayings on them. And of course, one of the very unique features of Bukit Brown Cemetery is a cross-cultural aspect, um, which is these uh, statues of sepoys, which were seen as guardians. And I think this is quite unique because I'm quite sure you wouldn't see this in Chinese cemetery in mainland China. You will also notice uh, this is a, a, an altar to the earth god. Uh, so many tombs have uh, such an altar, and it is customary for people who are visiting their uh, um, relatives who are buried in the cemetery to make offerings to the earth god uh, as well. And this is an example of a tomb that has been visited during the Qingming festival. Uh, it's customary for people to uh, place pieces of colored paper over the tomb the mound behind the tomb to show that they have actually visited their, their relative there. So these are all sorts of um, ritual practices, which are forms of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, you will also know that the government has built a four lane highway called Lonnie Highway across part of the cemetery. And this resulted in the loss of about 5,000 of the tombs out of 100,000. Um, it has also announced that eventually the rest of the cemetery will probably be cleared possibly in as little as 10 years to make way for housing. And so the cemetery in a sense is, is at risk of, of eventually being lost entirely. Uh, it was placed on the 2014 World Monuments Watch list of cultural heritage sites at risk. Now, what's interesting is that when it was announced that the government would be nominating the Singapore Botanic Gardens to be Singapore's first World Heritage Site, some people also called for Bukit Brown Cemetery to be nominated for such a listing as well. So the government's response at that time was that none of its stakeholders had suggested that the cemetery should be nominated, but it would study how it can be preserved, taking into account future development plans. So these development plans haven't really been announced in any great detail at all. Uh, I guess we will have to wait to see how extensive they are and whether uh, parts of the cemetery will be able to be retained in some form, perhaps as a, as a memorial park. So the intangible cultural heritage that's associated with the cemetery, or in fact the cemetery itself as a cultural space, might deserve some form of protection under the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention. And we can compare other places in the world that are already on the list. And one of them which I've highlighted here is the Jama'a Al-Fana Square, which is in Marrakesh, Morocco. And that was inscribed uh, for being a site where there is a concentration of musical, religious, and artistic impressions. So you can see that a site can be listed on the intangible cultural heritage list if it is a location where various kinds of intangible cultural heritage practices take place. Um, it's not just things which are entirely ten intangible, such as hawker culture in Singapore or types of traditional dance and all that, it could also be a place. So that's interesting. And you could argue that safeguarding the intangible cultural heritage relating to the cemetery, therefore justifies the cemetery as a whole being preserved. Um, and therefore you could even say maybe it should be a World Heritage Site. But of course at the moment, there is no indication that, um, this, that this will be um, going to be nominated as, as for protection under either of these schemes. Um, if you want to make a nomination for a, a site or a practice to be preserved under either the World Heritage Convention or the Intangible Cultural Heritage Convention, this has to be done by the government. Uh, it is not something that can be done by NGOs or, or individuals. 
So there's another scheme which is kind of interesting. Um, this is not a convention, it's just a program of UNESCO. It's called the Memory of the World Program. And according to UNESCO, the Memory of the World Program uh, aims to uh, show that the world's documentary heritage belongs to all and should therefore be fully preserved and protected for everyone. And with due recognition of cultural mores and practicalities should be permanently accessible to all without hindrance. And unlike the scheme, uh, unlike the World Heritage Site Scheme and the Intangible Cultural Heritage Scheme, nominations for the Memory of the World Program can actually be made by individuals and NGOs. So that's also, that makes it very interesting. So documentary heritage, you could say, is a kind of intangible cultural heritage. And it can include inscriptions on stele. Stele are um, stones, like large pieces of stones where you can have carvings on. So this raises the interesting questions on whether epigraphs, the inscriptions on tombstones in Bukit Brown Cemetery, might qualify. Um, as, a, as, a, as a form of um, comparison, uh, there is a place called the Temple of Literature in Hanoi. Some of you may have gone there. And the Temple of Literature contains 82 stone stele, which have information about laureates of the royal examinations that were held there between 1442 and 1779. And this is on the Memory of the World Register. Also, in uh, Myanmar, there is the Kutodor Inscription Shrines. And these consist of 729 slabs of stone on which are carved the Buddhist uh, Tipitaka, which are housed inside these uh, interesting shrine-like structures with domes, as you can see in the picture. So these are examples of um, stone inscriptions, which are actually on the memory of the world list. And this raises the interesting question of whether or not uh, tombstones in a cemetery, like in Bukit Brown Cemetery, might qualify for listing on some sort of register like this. Okay, now I'm going to turn from international law to look at domestic law. And the question I want to ask first is, how can intangible cultural heritage help to protect heritage? I think we've seen a little bit about this already uh, in what I've said so far. The interconnectedness between ICH and built heritage that is mentioned in international law is also to an extent reflected in our domestic Singapore law. In Singapore, we provide for legal protection for built heritage uh, and when I say built heritage, I mean things like buildings and, and so on, structures, through two pieces of legislation. So the first is the Planning Act. And under the Planning Act, you can declare conservation areas. I think we, you have definitely heard of this before, I hope. And you can also uh, use the Preservation of Monuments Act to make preservation orders in respect of national monuments. So under the Planning Act, where in the opinion of the Minister for National Development, any area is of special architectural, historic, traditional or aesthetic interest, the Minister can approve a proposal to amend the master plan to designate an area as a conservation area. So the UR, once a, a place is designated as a conservation area, the Urban Redevelopment Authority or URA's permission must be obtained to carry out works within the conservation area. And the concept of works is very broad. So it not only involves things like knocking down and redeveloping the building, in which in, in most cases you will not be allowed to do that, but it even includes things like external or internal decorative, painting, renovation, or other works that may affect its character or appearance. So the idea is that if a building is within a conservation area, there are more restrictions on what you can do to change its appearance. You can't even repaint it pink, for example, without asking for permission, because this may then change the character of the conservation area. So there are more restrictions on buildings in conservation area or have been listed with conservation protection than other buildings. Uh, so according to the master plan's written statement, when deciding if conservation permission should be given, the URA will take into consideration various planning guidelines that it has set up. For example, guidelines relating to what the building can be used for, the form of the building, uh, the urban design of the building, the plot size of the building, uh, and so on. What about the other scheme? So the other scheme that we have is the National Monument Scheme. And under the Preservation of Monuments Act, uh, this one is, is uh, managed by the National Heritage Board, not by the URA. So the National Heritage Board's function is to identify 
monuments that are of such historic, cultural, traditional, archaeological, architectural, artistic, or symbolic significance and national importance as to be worthy of preservation under this Act. And then it will make a recommendation to the Minister for Culture, Community, and Youth for preservation under the Act of such monuments that satisfy these criteria. Once a building is declared as a national monument, then the owner and occupier is required to take all reasonable measures to ensure that the national monument is properly maintained at all times in accordance with guidelines that will be issued by the board. And the National Heritage Board can make a preservation notice requiring works for the preservation, maintenance or repair of the site to be carried out at the owner or occupier's expense. So if your uh, building is kind of like in bad condition, actually the NHB can make an order requiring you to do some repairs. And any works that uh, are sought to be done uh, must be done only with the prior written approval of the National Heritage Board. And the board can impose conditions that uh, uh, may be necessary to protect the National Monument, in, uh, in, a, in, in particular requiring the works to be carried out according to certain specifications. And if the works cause damage, that you might be under an obligation to restore the site. So although the two acts, the Planning Act and the Preservation of Monuments Act do not go into a lot of detail, presumably any ICH that relates to a site would be taken into account when deciding whether to declare the site to be a conservation area or national monument in the first place. However, it's not very clear whether they do so. The acts are a bit silent on this um, and the schemes don't actually involve much public participation. The government is not actually legally obliged to conduct any heritage impact assessments or indeed to tell you uh, what their studies uh, reveal if they have done such impact assessments. So you will note from this that preservation of built heritage in Singapore is still largely carried out on a, a very top-down basis. Basically, uh, it is the government that initiates a lot of these things. And um, incidents such as the building of the road through Bukit Brown Cemetery sometimes have given rise to a sense that the government is a little bit reluctant to consult the public before taking action. So it seems that there was an environmental impact assessment done for the Bukit Brown Cemetery before the road was built, but to date it has not uh, released it, so we, we don't really know what that report says. However, I think things may be changing. Um, you will have heard of the Cross Island MRT line, which is uh, currently under construction. And the government, uh, when it was approaching this project, actually did two um, environmental impact assessments and it made them public. It put them on its website um, because part of the MRT line was proposed to cut through the central catchment nature reserve, which of course uh, the Nature Society and other groups uh, uh, were trying to persuade the government not to do and to try and bypass the catchment uh, nature reserve, the catch central catchment nature reserve. So I think that this greater transparency of uh, making these EIAs available publicly to, to read uh, is to be welcomed because it provides a lot of background information that people can then read, digest, and use to better understand and evaluate the, the difficult issues that may be involved in deciding how the project should go ahead. And we know that at the end of the day, the government did decide not to reroute the line to avoid the reserve. So the, the MRT line is planned to cut through the nature reserve, although it's going to be underground. So the main disruption is during the construction process, not when the um, line is running, although there may be some vibration and so on. I think the main disruption is likely to be during the construction process. Uh, so while it, it, do, it did decide that eventually the line is going to run through part of the nature reserve, uh, the, the nature reserve, it did hold consultations with the Nature Society and others. And I think such public consultation and engagement is also something that we should welcome. And even the final decision is not what a lot of uh, people hope for. People feel that because of this consultation, their views have been heard and considered. And, and so they perhaps are more accepting of the decision in, 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 um, in the long run. So the, the second question that I would now consider is, the flip side is we just considered whether intangible cultural heritage can be used to protect built heritage. But the, uh, the, the corresponding question is, can built heritage then help to protect intangible cultural heritage? And uh, I'm gonna suggest that it can also do so because it's a neutral thing. 
currently we don't have any laws that protect intangible cultural heritage specifically. So there's no specific legal protection for it. Japan, on the other hand, actually has a law for protection of cultural properties. So, um, for example, they have a scheme where uh, practitioners of intangible cultural heritage can be declared to be national, cult, national cultural treasures and, and they're given a special status. So um, it's interesting whether we, we should maybe have some kind of scheme like that. Um, NHB has a, a, a scheme, has just started a scheme uh, for awarding, giving of awards to uh, stewards of cultural heritage. So that's kind of similar, although it's not legal, um, in, uh, it's not legal in nature, but it's a kind of recognition that there are communities and people there who are uh, serving to be stewards of our cult intangible cultural heritage. So that's something similar, I suppose. Um, how can built heritage though protect ICH? Um, are there or should there be any restrictions on how national monuments and conservation areas uh, can be used to safeguard the ICH that's associated with them. And here I'm going to give an example of uh, Chimes. Uh, I hope that some of you have been to Chimes before. Chimes Hall used to be the chapel of the Convent of the Holy Infant Jesus, which is a school. And when the school moved out from the site, which is uh, in the center of town, the chapel was deconsecrated and declared a national monument. And this happened in 1990. So the chapel is kind of in the center of the site, and that's a national monument. Around it, there are some other buildings as well as a, a, a wall. And those are not part of the national monument, but they are declared to be a conservation area. So there are restrictions on what you can do to them. So the Chimes Complex, as you know, uh, is no longer a religious building. It's now shops, restaurants, pubs, and you know, it's an entertainment area. Um, and you can actually rent the Chimes Hall itself for functions such as weddings and what the Chimes website calls corporate events, right? You can have uh, conferences and, and things there, I suppose. Yeah. So what happened was, uh, and this, sorry, and this is a picture of, of course, the uh, Chimes Hall itself, the former uh, chapel. And this is the interior of the chapel. So what happened in 2012 was that various complaints were made to the police. Uh, and various government departments about an event that uh, was supposed to be organized at the uh, hall. It was called the Escape Chapel Party. And I don't know whether this was intentional or unintentional, but it was to be held on Holy Saturday. And Holy Saturday is the day between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So you're, you can recognize that this is probably a, a, an important period for Christians, right? They're going to, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, these are both important Christian festivals um, for Christians. Uh, however, the party was going to be held in between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And in the promotional material, the organizer said it would be a sacrilegious night of partying. And in the advertising, they included photographs of women dressed in skimpy nuns costumes. Um, and I actually went online and I found some. So this is a uh, uh, what it looked like. Uh, now, the Roman Catholic Archbishop was not happy and he said, this event is scandalous to the church. And um, I, I suppose it's, a, it's, it's quite unlucky, but you may know that the Roman Catholic Archdiocese is directly opposite Chimes. <laughs> so this is happening right opposite the headquarters of the Roman Catholic Church in Singapore. And in the end, the organizers canceled the event and said, we, you know, we really apologize for any offense that we might have caused. Um, and I think this raises the interesting question of, should some selected heritage buildings have conditions imposed on their use to help to preserve people's cultural memory of the building significance and thus safeguard the ICH that continues to surround the building, even though it is no longer used for, for its original purpose? Because then, in, in a sense, you are using the built structure to protect the ICH that may exist uh, in connection with the building. So I'll just say a little bit about what the Singapore Heritage Society, uh, how it is involved in, in some of these uh, debates and discussions. I think the SHS wants to encourage all of us to think about heritage in different ways. Um, one way, one thing to think about is authenticity. So what we really want to preserve is a genuine type of heritage. Uh, you don't want to uh, have a exoticized 
an overly simplified version of heritage for tourist consumption only, because that's not real, right? It's, it's like a, um, a romanticized picture, which is not reflective of what history was really like. And I think you want to try and avoid that if you can, although there may be a temptation to kind of um, play up the, the uh, oriental nature of it or something just to attract tourists, right? Um, perhaps one example is this idea of Chinatown. Um, my understanding is that Chinatown is actually a fairly recent term that has been adopted for the area that we now know as Chinatown. Um, in the past, it was known as uh, in Malay as Krita Aye or in uh, Mandarin or in dialects as New Chersui, uh, now Terasoi, right? And it is nowadays pitched as a kind of Chinese enclave, but is that really accurate? Because um, we know that there's always been um, a Malay community there, there's always been um, an Indian community there, and we know that there are mosques, we know there are major uh, Hindu temples in there. And so should we then artificially kind of play out this idea of a, of a Chineseness of the site when uh, it is it may not be an accurate picture of it? So maybe we want to think about the importance of authenticity. Another thing we want to think about is multiple perspectives. Um, Again, there may be a temptation to tell only one side of a story because it is easier for people to understand that way. And this could be, for example, a very colonial type narrative um, of a place, uh, or it could be a narrative that extols the achievement of certain elites or groups. Um, so this idea of the, of the, the great man theory, if you've ever heard about it in, in history, the idea that history uh, changes and develops because there are these great leaders that we have and then you don't really look at what ordinary people did or what ordinary people, how ordinary people live their lives and so on. And so in connection with this, um, should heritage be neatly segregated along CMIO, Chinese, Malay, Indian, others lines. What about influences between ethnic groups and blended histories and uh, these sorts of things that we want to look at rather than let's look at Chinese history, let's look at Malay heritage, let's look at Indian heritage, right? Maybe we should be looking more at influences and, and blended ideas and things like that. Uh, so an example of, of uh, some of the work that the Heritage Society is doing is what it's uh, doing with Pula Ubin. I hope that many of you have visited Pulau Ubin before. Literally, it means granite island in Malay. And it's very small, it's about 10 kilometers square. And it's uh, off the northeast or coast of the main island of Singapore. And uh, there have been many calls to protect the flora and fauna, uh, the wildlife on the island, as well as to preserve its rustic kampong life um, without making it like a theme park, right? Um, so this is an old map of Pulau Ubin. And uh, this is what you see when you uh, land on the ferry on the island. And it's still very rustic in, in many ways. So uh, the Singapore Heritage Society joined the Friends of the Urban Network, or FUN, and this is a National Parks Board initiative back in 2014. And uh, one of our recommendations was that a cultural mapping exercise uh, should be conducted to inform any kind of policy making uh, regarding the island. And the idea is that you should kind of find out who lives on the island, what their relationships are, how do they live their lives. Um, so you get an idea of, of the kind of community that is on the island and, and what you want to try and preserve. And the National Heritage Board indeed decided to do this and it completed its study in 2016. Um, and since the 2018, uh, the society has continued to be involved in networking with the families that live on the island to help to revitalize the Kampong community and to continue to, to make it a, a lively place, I think. So in conclusion, uh, I just want to talk about some of the challenges that we have moving forward. I think uh, we all recognize by now that protection of all kinds of heritage always poses challenges of some kind. Um, where intangible cultural heritage is concerned, one of the challenges is that we have a largely immigrant population in, in Singapore. And so our population has close cultural links with a lot of our neighboring countries, naturally. 
and therefore claims over what constitutes intangible cultural heritage could possibly be controversial. Uh, back in 2009, Malaysia's uh, tourism minister, who was then uh, Ng Yen Yen, claimed that other countries, whom she did not name, have hijacked some of Malaysia's traditional dishes, which um, these were meant to be Malaysian traditional dishes. So I'll leave you to have a look and see whether you agree that they are really Malaysian in nature or whether they are really shared between the culture in Malaysia and Singapore and other places. So in fact, um, this kind of issue was foreseen by the convention uh, dealing with ICH. And it recognizes that some types of intangible cultural property often cannot be confined within the borders of one country. And it actually encourages, UNESCO encourages countries to propose uh, multinational inscriptions. For example, back in 2013, uh, it was decided by uh, Cyprus, Croatia, Spain, Greece, Italy, Morocco, and Portugal to jointly nominate the Mediterranean diet for subscription uh, on the list, and it was successful. So of course, the Mediterranean diet will be shared by many, many countries that border the Mediterranean Sea. And it makes sense to uh, have a joint sort of uh, nomination rather than for the different countries to vie and say, no, no, I, I will, I, my country is the true representative of Mediterranean diet, and so I should be the one to uh, uh, go forward, move forward with the nomination. And similarly, I, I recall that on the list, things like flamenco dancing are shared by both Spain and countries in Latin America. And so they did a, a joint um, nomination as well. So this is definitely possible uh, that countries can, can make a joint nomination. Other challenges are that um, economic development is often given higher priority than protecting heritage, um, which is, uh, I think, a, a challenge. And we need to think about whether it is right to say that when push comes to shove, if you've got economic development on the one hand and heritage on the other, then economic development should always outweigh heritage. Surely we can try and think of ways in which we try and give um, as much scope to both of them and to bear in mind the importance of heritage whenever we pursue economic development. Otherwise, it will always be a, a, a zero-sum game when economic development will always outweigh it and you lose the heritage, which is not a very satisfactory result. So um, another issue is that, um, as I mentioned, you might want to think about how you can use built heritage to protect ICH. And one way to do this would be to legally restrict the kinds of uses that you can put the built heritage to in order to protect the ICH. But this can lead to some uh, unhappiness on, on the part of some people. For example, uh, it may conflict with the idea of adaptive reuse of buildings. The idea of adaptive reuse is that you have a historic building, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be used for its original purpose. You can change it into something else. An old clan association building can be changed into a restaurant, for example, but you can retain the, the way the outside the exterior looks and so on. Um, because it may not always be feasible to say, I've got an old clan building, it can forever only be used as a clan building. Then if you can't find a clan that wants to take it over, then the building remains unused and derelict. So it doesn't seem to be a good idea. In some cases, you would have to allow some kind of adaptive reuse um, uh, for such buildings, uh, perhaps. And again, if you impose a lot of restrictions on the use of historic buildings, then it could be that the buildings will become less attractive to developers or people wanting to rent them. And therefore, the building itself may fall in value and maybe no one wants to, to rent it or to buy it and so on. Um, but again, I think um, we need to balance this. You want to try and allow some flexibility for developers and tenants on how they want to use the building. But again, you may not want it to be such a radical change that uh, any ICH that's associated with a building is completely lost. So it's, it's a difficult issue. It's a challenge. These are some of the things that uh, people working with heritage need to think about. So 
we need to ask ourselves whether a combination of restrictions and maybe incentives to, enco uh, to encourage some kind of voluntary adherence to recommend uh, recommended or preferred uses could be more appropriate. But ultimately, I think we need to find that balance if, in all cases uh, between um, development and heritage. Because if we don't, and development always seems to be the one that outweighs heritage, then our people may start feeling dislocated or feel that they have lost their identity, they don't recognize anything anymore, everything's changing so quickly, um, which is also not a good thing to have. And so hopefully we can all work together and try to find some way in which we can accommodate both heritage and progress. Okay, um, that's the end of my presentation. So uh, just a little plug for the Singapore Heritage Society. Uh, if you are interested in, in um, becoming a member, there are some links there on how you can uh, actually sign up to be a member or, or visit our Facebook page and, and like us on Facebook or Instagram and follow us. Or if you would like to support us by um, making a donation, you can go to giving.sg or you can use PayNow, the QR code is there. Um, and also, um, uh, I've also written an article uh, about what about some of the issues which I've talked about today. It is a legal article, so it might be a little bit technical, but if you're interested in, in, in um, reading more about it, you can also uh, go to the website that's um, on the QR code on the left. Okay, so I think I will hand you back to Baba House and um, we'll do our question and answer. Thank you, Dr. Jack. Okay. Sorry. Oh. Yes. Should you what? Sorry. No, 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 I just wanted to know whether I should leave that last screen up for a while or something, maybe later. Huh? Okay, yeah, we can also provide the link to the article. Uh, but yes, okay. thank you so much for the uh, insightful talk, uh, especially with the, some, with, with the particularities of various global and national initiatives of the legal aspects of recognizing buildings, right? As well as the mm -hmm. uh, local examples, having this idea of public consultation, uh, the balance between development and heritage. I think those are very kind of important questions that are starting to be more and more uh, prevalent. I think the first thing mm -hmm. that came to mind when you were mentioning this balance between progress and heritage is how far do how far back do we go in determining mm -hmm. what is heritage in the first place? Because I, I think that is an uh, important mm -hmm. question with more recent buildings such as like the Golden Mall Complex and perhaps other modernist buildings. Okay. Um, I think it, 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 it's a um, case-by-case basis thing. Um, obviously, if you're talking about a building, in many cases, the building, if it is old, will have gone through a lot of different stages in its history. Um, and a good example is uh, Victoria Theatre and Concert Hall. Right? It started off being a fairly small building um, which was, I think it was used as a, a concert venue from quite early on. And then subsequently, it was decided to expand the building in the 20th century. So they then built another building next to it that mirrored the existing building. So now you've got two sides and then they built a clock tower in the center. Um, so you could say, at which stage do you want to revert the building to? Um, and I think that most times they will, the, the, the people who are having to deal with this difficult issue will have to see whether the interventions in the building are significant. So obviously you're not gonna like knock down one whole part of the building and then revert back to a single room, right? Uh, a single building on one side. You're gonna keep the, the new 20th century edition as well as the clock tower because it's quite an, a, a large major um, intervention to the building. Um, so sometimes choices like that are made, but if let's say the um, change that's been made to the building is thought to be not particularly aesthetically interesting, um, then they may decide to strip that out and revert the building to an earlier form. So I think it's hard to say uh, that there's a hard and fast rule for this thing. You really have to look at the building itself and look at its history and decide uh, how far back you want to go, or whether you perhaps different parts of the building could reflect different parts of its history. 
I see. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so this is the time for also question and answer. Um, please mm -hmm. do share some of the questions that you may have had over the course of the uh, talk. I'll just briefly show you the kind of question, the tips that you may have for the Q&A session. If any questions for um, Dr. Dr. Lee, uh, please type in your question in, in the chat and the moderator who's me, will then fill them uh, to him during this session. So if you have other, any other, other questions or administrative issues, please also let us know. Um, perhaps we shall also then wait a bit for some time for any questions to come in. In the meantime, I think, yeah, your point about authenticity also stands out quite a lot because at the Baba House, we're also always constantly thinking about what is old, what is new, things that were added on later, if they were structurally not sound, should we just take them down? So I think that point really resonates as well with a lot of the built heritage. The position was made about Baba House actually. Um, is, it, is it all um, restored to a particular period in time or, or are there like different parts which relate to different times? Um, so there is kind of an old wing of the house and a new wing of the house. So the old wing oh, okay. is made out of, you know, brick and plaster, and it is the house as it was in 1910. Um, I mean, not all of it, and the, the furniture in it, for example, is part of our museum collection, but the structures, the architecture otherwise is quite original to, or as much as possible, trying to restore it to that time. Whereas mm -hmm. the back of the house, because of development over the years with the addition of the back lane, um, with the addition of plumbing. So that part is now new. And I think there is that quite conscious decision for all of us to make sure that our visitors do know what part is old and what part is new so that they don't feel and conflict everything together as part of the same house. Yeah. Okay, so okay. <laughs> we have one question. Okay, Thanks. so um, we've got a question from Emily. Hi, I'm Emily from Taiwan. I visited the Baba House. Oh, it's not a question. <laughs> um, in February 2020. And yeah, she just really wants to know, let you know that she enjoyed the, the talk. Oh, um, we've also okay. got another question um, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, are museum and heritage centers a good idea to preserve heritage? Um, which one is that? Oh, are museum and heritage centers a good idea? Um, Yes, I think so. Um, I think it, it depends on um, what you are going to have in the heritage centre. Uh, let's say, for example, a building um, is going to be used for adaptive reuse, right? So it's not going to retain its original use. It's going to be turned into something else. Then it would be quite nice, actually, if you uh, had a, a heritage centre um, that said something about what the building used to be and its significance and so on. Um, I, I think that that would be um, a way of telling people about what the building's history was and may, maybe also to talk, talk about some of the intangible cultural heritage that's associated with the building. Uh, so, so yeah, I think that would be great. And of course, sometimes, um, unfortunately, the, the building itself cannot be saved. Then uh, if, if it's a significant building in terms of the history of Singapore, uh, parts of, of it can be saved and, and then moved to a museum. Of course, that is... Uh, uh, less desirable than if you, of course, have the original building, but sometimes it's not always possible, right? The building is structurally unsound or something like that, and, and it just can't be saved. So um, that would be a way in which you can uh, preserve built heritage. And of course, museums and heritage centers are also ways in which you can preserve um, intangible cultural heritage. Um, sometimes the artifacts that you see in a museum, for example, can throw some light on the intangible cultural heritage. But increasingly, I think we are expecting that museums have programming. It used to be uh, when I was younger that when you went into a museum, all you did was walk around and look at static displays and signs. But clearly that's not the case nowadays. You look at a modern museum, whether in Singapore or anywhere in the world, and you will expect there to be programs organized by the museum. And often these will be things like traditional dance, um, art, um, the art uh, performances and so on. And these are ways in which a museum can actually try to bring back some of that intangible cultural heritage and showcase it as well. And I think we really, uh, um, really expect that to be the, the mission of museums and heritage centers these days. 
Thank you. Um, I see another question. I see one from Pam, is it? Yes. Hmm. So Pam says, um, one of the newer heritage spaces up for discussion now is Changi Point Old Changi Hospital. The entire area is so diverse, ranging from colonial buildings, histories relating to the war, POWs and medical progress, plus rich coastal diversity and scenic landscape. There are many suggestions ranging from a love shrine, gosh, I don't know what that is, uh, to medical facilities. Is it possible to balance all these various ideas in the building? Uh, Challenging, right? The larger the site is, I think the more challenging it will be to, to determine what you can do with it. Because, for example, um, if it's in uh, Changi, it's a little bit out of the way. So, if let's say you turn the whole building into a museum, would people go, right? And that would be a question. Would it be um, viable a as a museum? Um, it might not be, in which case then you have to think about other uses. Um, it could be maybe like a school um, or it could be a spa retreat, a hotel, you know. So I, I guess uh, it has to be a question of talking to prospective developers and tenants on what they might like to do with the building and hopefully also preserving the spirit of the place so that it's not uh, changing it too much, um, but allowing it to be used in a meaningful way as well and not something that's going to be essentially deserted all the time and then people will, uh, the tenant will be unable to make much of a business, then they will pack up and move out and they'll be vacant again. So you want to try and avoid that, I guess, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, there are some questions in the chat, actually. So mm. they we're actually asking some a bit more about the legal aspects of it, such as does being nominated and accepted on the memory of the world program have any effect in preventing governments from demolishing the nominated heritage site? Um, the answer is no. Uh, usually for these international things, uh, there's no world government that can stop uh, a local government of a country from doing anything. But the idea is that there is some prestige to having um, either a site or a form of ICH listed on one of these international registers. And when you make a nomination, you are obliged to say that you are going to safeguard it. <laughs> it's part of the conditions, right? You make certain promises that yes, you will try and safeguard it. Um, and in fact, you are required to describe how you're going to safeguard it. Um, and and therefore, you, you're, on, you're likely to only be successful in your nomination if the uh, UNESCO assessment body says, yeah, okay, I, I'm convinced by what you're planning to do and so on. In, in fact, there, there have been situations where uh, World Heritage Sites have been listed on the list, but because of developments that happen later, they are considered to be under um, uh, threat. And what has then happened is uh, this was pointed out to the country by UNESCO. And if the country does nothing and maybe allows for tall buildings to be built around the heritage area, uh, I think there are one or two cases, very rare, but one or two cases where the site was actually deregistered, which of course is um, uh, not, it doesn't look good like, for your country, right? That you had a heritage site and then it lost its heritage status because, because of all the development, that, that incompatible development that went on around it. So, I mean, it is possible, but actually there's not much that an international body can do to prevent governments from, um, in a sense, uh, uh, jeopardizing their own heritage in their, in their country. Um, and what's more, memory of the world is, um, it's not even like a convention, right? It's just a, a program that's, that's run by UNESCO that tries to encourage people to identify um, important documentary sources so that people realize that they exist and then um, uh, um, they are listed so that people know and then there's more publicity given to them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yun An says, I am currently doing a heritage study in Pai Labor Air Base. You mentioned the way of using multiple perspectives to describe and interpret the heritage. Do you find it hard to search other narratives when doing some course research? Ooh. <laughs> okay, so I myself am not a historian. I'm actually uh, trained legally. 
Um, well, I'm sure that there's always a challenge in trying to find out what the different narratives are. Um, yes, there may be an issue of some documents being classified and therefore difficult to access. Sometimes it's a matter of writing to the department that originated the documents and asking for permission to access them. Because I have encountered a situation where I went to the National Archives and wanted to look up some burial records and was told by the National Archives that, oh, um, this is classified according to uh, the Ministry of the Environment, I, th I believe. Um, but then I then wrote to the Ministry of the Environment and they said, oh yeah, actually it's an old burial record of a cemetery that no longer exists in Singapore, so no problem, we'll give you permission. <laughs> so sometimes it's because no one has gone through all the documents to decide whether they can be declassified or not, and therefore they still remain classified as confidential. But if you write to them with saying, I'm doing research and all that, they might be quite willing to say, yeah, we have no problem and, and send a letter, they will send a letter or email to National Archives and, and that can uh, allow you to access those documents, right? Um, apart from that, I mean, if the documents really are classified and you can't access them, um, you have to think of other strategies. So sometimes it would be oral history, talking to people who might have lived in the area, um, to find out more about the stories there, looking at uh, people who have written about the area, you know, books that you can access in the library, things like that, um, or even sometimes overseas archives, right? You, you might be able to find, uh, if, let's say you're looking at colonial documents, sometimes the colonial documents are available in the archives in London, uh, in Kew. Uh, of course, that becomes much more inconvenient to access, but you never know, right? Sometimes you can find these documents in, in overseas archives as well. Uh, so which one should I answer next? <laughs> um, I think we can go with perhaps the question of, of a more general one about how the goal of heritage, usually, uh, the goal of the um, mm, okay. government is usually to maximize economic development and what kind yeah. of incentive would they have to protect the more intangible heritage? Well, I mean, hopefully there seems to be uh, more recognition nowadays that it is important to protect heritage um, because heritage is one of those uh, in, I guess, the intangible, you know, kind of like not hard things, but kind of the soft software of, of, of a nation, which nonetheless has value. If you just concentrate on the hardware, then you may lose this idea of rootedness. People don't feel that they have any um, stake belonging stake in the country. And I think that is never a good thing, right? Because if, if let's say um, you engender this idea that I'm just here for my job, I don't really have any particular uh, love for the, for the country and all that, then if hard times come, people are just going to leave, you know, and you certainly don't want to have a situation like that. So building the software, I think is important and heritage is part of that. Um, building community, building heritage. So uh, hopefully the idea is not to maximize economic development at the expense of such things. Uh, I see a question from Helen about views on partial conservation like facadism. Yeah, not a good thing if you can avoid it as, as far as possible. So I think this is a, 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 a challenge, partly of URA to come up with suitable um, conservation guidelines on what can or cannot be done with the building uh, and balancing that with allowing for some adaptive reuse. I mean, it's always going to be a tricky issue, I think, um, because you often don't want to place too many restrictions on development. If you do, then what happens is that developers may say, ah, it's too troublesome, I, I, I'm not gonna to touch this site. Um, and then it remains kind of derelict and undeveloped, which is also not a good thing. Uh, so it's a question of trying to get that balance. But I think if all you're really going to preserve is really just one facade of one wall, that does seem a little bit 
um, artificial. <laughs> you know, uh, it would be better if at least you, you retain uh, entire building and all that and maybe have fewer restrictions on what you can do with the inside. Um, one example of that is uh, the National Gallery, right? So part of it used to be City Hall. Um, and the City Hall exterior is basically the same, right? It's retained. However, the inside is, is I think, quite radically changed. Um, the, the rooms are maybe not so uh, changed. Um, I think they did retain the more or less the shape of a lot of the rooms. Not all, some of them have been, the walls have been moved, but certainly the atrium in the center is completely different. And um, nonetheless, if it was going to be turned into uh, an art gallery, I think you probably needed something like that to retain the original layout of the courtrooms and so on um, would, would make it very difficult to use it as, a, as a, an art gallery. And indeed, the courtrooms were a very late um, intervention, you know, way into the 20th century already when it was turned into a, a, a courthouse. So in a sense, I think maybe that's not so bad. Yeah. But yeah, as far as possible, try not to have something very jarring, uh, you know, um, a very strange juxtaposition between a very super modern building and a very old building or just retaining like a wall on the outside. That's a bit strange. Um, Daniel Chu has a question on Dover Forest. Dover Forest is marked with a stone tablet belonging to Tan Kim Seng's legacy and Clementi Forest has much older objects, such as a night saw bucket and a portable chimney tower plus old tunnel walls and infrastructure relating to the KTM railway system. Should they be curated in museums and the old KTM brick wall infrastructure conserved in any way? Uh, also, can any of our current nature reserves be gazetted as UNESCO sites? Okay, so um, regarding the first question, um, I think it depends on how vulnerable those items are to deterioration. So if let's say it is a stone tablet and it's probably not going to be damaged by the weather and it's not going to be lost, then I would say as far as possible, leave it in situ until something needs to be done about it. But if it's something like a night soil bucket, which is going probably, I don't know, I'm assuming it's made of metal, right? It's going to rust away. And if you feel that it's that precious um, or it's easily carried away by somebody, then maybe you will need to consider relocating it. Um, so this, this has been done you know, in various countries. Um, I, I, what comes to mind is Venice, for example. So if you've ever been to Venice, there is a St. Mark's um, Basilica, Basilica um, which, which is a major uh, church building. And there's a prominent sculpture of four horses on the top of the building. The horses are actually replicas. <laughs> they felt that it was too dangerous to leave the marble originals of the statues exposed uh, to the elements outside. So they actually moved them into a museum and they put up a replica onto the building itself. I mean, not ideal, but then if you think that some precious parts of your structure are actually going to deteriorate and you can't really stop that, then maybe it is better to, to relocate them to a place where the, the conditions can be more uh, controlled in terms of humidity and, and so on. Um, so yeah, I think it, it does depend, but obviously if, if it's something like a, um, stone tablets and all that, which are not going to be easily damaged or tombstones and so on, there's nothing wrong with uh, leaving them in situ un until something happens and you need to move them away. Uh, when our current nature reserves can be gazetted as UNESCO sites, um, it really depends on the criteria. So a lot of our um, sites are actually not primary forests. They are already cleared before and maybe they grew back again. So they're kind of secondary forest, I think. Uh, so whether or not that would qualify for protection under World Heritage, I'm, I'm a little bit doubtful. <laughs> uh, I think that they may not be protectable purely as nature sites. You would have to bring in some history element to say, Bogotima Nature Reserve, you know, is a good example of a, I'm just, you know, I'm just speculating here, right? It's a good example of a colonial quarry or something and bring in some of its heritage and then it would be the nature plus something else 
maybe it will qualify. But you really need to sort of look at the criteria of um, the sites that are already listed. And my suspicion is a lot of them are really completely untouched, you know, sites, uh, nature sites are, they, they haven't been subject to any kind of development, have not been cleared before. Um, and so I think those would stand a much better chance of being uh, uh, listed as World Heritage Sites. Um, I see a question about Bukit China here. Uh, Bukit China, is it equivalent to Bukit Brown? Could the two join together as a heritage site in order to save the place? Hmm. Well, um, there are situations where more than one place in different countries have kind of combined together to be protected as a single site. I think, I, I think there are a few examples of that. But the main thing I think would be, would the governments of the two nations be willing to do so? Because uh, as I had mentioned in the presentation, um, a World Heritage Site nomination can only be made by the government of the country. So if the government of the country is not keen on the idea, then basically it's not going to happen. So you first need the individual governments of the two countries to want to do this and to want to cooperate with, with each other. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, I mean, of course, uh, one example which didn't happen was that Malaysia successfully nominated Malacca and Penang to be preserved as a World Heritage Site as two of the three supplements, the straight supplements. The last one is Singapore, right? So it could have been a joint nomination to nominate Singapore, Malacca and uh, Penang to be the straight supplements. But actually they decided to just uh, uh, go on their own and, and nominate those two sites. So, you know, uh, that, that I suppose could have been done. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. So I think it depends on that. Um, let's see. Wow, a lot of questions coming in now. Uh, how much time do we have left? We have about five minutes. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, do you want to pick some questions? Uh, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, let's, let's go with the one about the, the ICH, like Chinese opera. So I mean, most of your presentation mm. was about built heritage as kind of also mm. a basis, right? But what about yeah. things that are still in the sense tangible and physical but not built yeah so if let's say the site is is actually temporary it is then um and especially not just temporary but it changes location right because good time i'm not always in the same place always so let's say for example yeah it's the nature sorry excuse me it's, it's the nature of, of um, the, the kind of performance. So let's say, for example, the example I gave earlier about um, the square in Marrakesh, um, which was protected as a cultural space, right? This one was a permanent place where they always have these markets and they always have uh, people doing performances and so on. So it's kind of like a, there's some permanence to the place. And therefore, you could argue that this place as a whole can be is always worthy of protection uh, under a form of ICH. I think if it's temporary, then it's a lot harder. You might as well then try to just say, I want to protect um, the art form of Gertai itself as an ICH. And the building of the stage is incidental to that rather than to try and protect the space itself. Unless, for example, it is a space that is used regularly. So there was some mention about how um, a, a, a cultural space can be a periodic space, right? So for example, um, there could be a place up a mountain somewhere. And during a certain season or festival in a year, people go up on a pilgrimage to that site. So even though it is not continuously used throughout the year for that, because it is used on a cyclical basis, on a regular basis for this particular cultural activity, then you could argue that such a site deserves protection. So, I mean, you could then argue something like Bukit Brown Cemetery, for example, is a site where people go once a year during Qingming to perform rituals relating to um, honoring the, the deceased. So then you could say the site as a whole deserves to be protected because you will then also protect the ICH. It's the site of this cultural activity, right? So it could be something like that. Yeah. Um, if a family, uh, I see a question, if a family can't afford to restore the heritage property under their care, can they get help from the government? I think that it's a very small fund that 
people can apply for if they are the owner or the tenant of a national monument. I don't know whether that applies to conservation areas, uh, but I know that the, under the national monument scheme, there is a small fund. But usually people tap on this fund to um, use for maintaining or restoring the building. It's not for like major work. So I, I don't know how much of a grant you would have. Usually you have to find additional funding from somewhere else. Um, and, and that could be challenging, right? So um, Cathedral of the Good Shepherd, which is the oldest Roman Catholic church in Singapore, um, underwent a, a very major renovation. And this is a national monument. Um, and I think they, they might have got some funding from the government, but a lot of it had to be privately raised through through donation drive and so on. So yes, you, you might be able to get some funding, but it, it will probably not be enough for the entire uh, need that you have. I think that's the explanation for that. Yeah. Um, Shall we end with the last question? I think it, it's quite an apt ending about how the, um, the one no, 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 no. The, the community oh, museums okay. and yeah. grassroots initiatives. What extent can community museums contribute to the preservation of local memories and stories that are often buried under the narratives? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, again, if we don't like the idea that heritage should be top down, then we should really be encouraging um, individuals and communities to think about how they can investigate and promote their own, own local heritage. Um, and I, I think this is now something that is uh, happening in a lot of places in Singapore. Um, there's uh, my Queenstown. Um, uh, that's probably one of the, the, the ones that have been going on for a while, right? People who are interested in preserving the history of Queenstown uh, all came together to, to um, put up a community museum and also to promote tours of their, of their location and all that. And I think this is really good because a lot of times there are places with heritage value in Singapore and obviously in other countries as well, where it may not be so obvious that there is something that's worth preparing, uh, preserving or safeguarding. And it needs the local community to point that out, that, hey, there's something really interesting here and you should really preserve it. And if you can show that the community knows about it, is interested in protecting it. There is a kind of a constituency of people interested in protecting it. Then I think it makes the chances that it will be given some kind of uh, protection or support uh, much more likely. So let's say, for example, there's an old school building. And a lot of times, you know, um, the alumni say, wow, we really want to preserve this, this historic um, uh, school building. What can we do? If you can show that a lot of alumni are really interested in preserving it, then the chances of it perhaps being designated a conservation site are higher than if, let's say, no one is really interested and everyone thinks, uh, you know, it's such an ugly building, who cares about it? Then, then basically, it's not likely to happen, right? So I think if you have this local community that has sprung up, that's interested in it and are, are, are organizing themselves, then it really helps to support um, greater recognition maybe uh, for it to be a conservation area and so on. So I recall also that um, there are moves for Farrah Park swimming pool and you know the sports complex there. Hopefully parts of it to be preserved even though there's going to be redevelopment in the area but because there are people who use um, uh, Farrah Park and Farrah Park has some part in the sporting history of Singapore, uh, you know that, that, that then makes it uh, more likely that uh, the, the authorities will, will look closely at it and say, hmm, maybe there is something there. Uh, yeah. Um, is that time to deal with this last question about um, damage? Okay, yeah, we can, we, can, we can answer that last question. Okay. So, I mean, very quickly, I mean, a damaged heritage site, uh, it, it depends on how badly damaged it is, right? So, sometimes um, if, if, if it is salvageable, uh, there is um, some value in trying to put it back together again. Some architects will talk about anastomosis, <laughs> if you've ever heard of that. So basically, let's say, for example, that there's a historic bridge in Srebrenica, and it was bombed during the Yugoslav War. Um, and it's a historic bridge. What they actually do is they pick up all the bits of broken stone, and they try and reuse as much of it as possible to put the bridge back together again. So I mean, this is like really trying to preserve as much of it as possible. 
But if let's say it is really very badly damaged, sometimes if you're, if you're really just going to reconstruct it entirely with something fake, then you really do need to ask yourselves, is there much value in doing that? People have done that over the years, right? Um, so in a lot of cities in Germany that were bombed severely during World War II, they have actually put up modern buildings that look like the old buildings that used to surround the market square. If you went there, you probably wouldn't know unless someone told you that actually these are 20th century reproductions of the original medieval buildings. You might not even realize that. But it was felt that if we, we just put up modern buildings, it will change the character of the square. So we want to recapture that, that idea of the, what the historic marketplace, market square. And so they've, they've done that. But on the other hand, you have examples like the Bamiyan um, Buddhas um, in Afghanistan. And those were bombed by the Taliban uh, and completely destroyed. And so far, the, the view has been you really shouldn't reconstruct like a, a, a fake Bamiyan Buddha and put it back in the niche again, because it just won't be genuine. Um, so, so, you know, I think it, it's, it's not always sometimes difficult to, to have a straightforward answer. Yes, you should always do it or no, you shouldn't do it. It really depends on, on the site itself and what people think, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. I think, uh, yeah, that's all the time we have for the questions. Uh, I think, okay. yeah, Jack, you're kind of pulling from all these different case studies and examples, I think really helped in illuminating a lot of the themes that we've been talking about and the questions that the uh, audience oh, had. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, thank you uh, for joining us in this program, both um, Dr. Lee and um, our audience. So for those of you who have not visited uh, the Bala House before, um, you, yeah, we are currently open for uh, bookings from on, on weekdays. So outside of that, um, I just also wanted to talk a bit about the APRU University Museums Research Symposium that we are holding at the end of this year. We've just started our call for submissions. So if you have videos or if you have papers that you'd like to submit regarding architectural heritage and the university, please do uh, take a look at our website. Uh, and there are also upcoming talks in the series. So um, from today's talk, I think it will be very interesting to segue into the next talk by Dr. Hamza Muzaini, who looks at um, heritage from below and how a cultural site such as the Sarawak Cultural Village can both be tangible and intangible and create even more new significance from it. Um, we also have um, Dr. Arieta Atali and Dr. Eric Kerr talking a bit more about technology and documentation in heritage towards uh, the end of May and early June. And please do also fill in our feedback form uh, if you would like to comment on um, the session that you've had today. Other than that, thank you so much. That's all we have for this afternoon. Um, please have a, a good afternoon ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.